everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our weekly uh, webinar series sponsored by the AHS. Um, please remember to follow AHS social media listed on the right side. Happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers out there. And uh, for all of those of you that are not mothers, if you forgot to call your mother, after this would be a great time to do so. Um, so tonight's topic is a brachial plexus injury. We have, a, again, a nationally and internationally renowned uh, panel uh, for you. As a reminder, and obviously you all registered, but uh, we have webinars at least planned for the end of this month and likely will continue. But um, again, we'll have nationally and internationally uh, recognized folks talking about all the other topics you see listed here. And then immediately following this at 8.15, we will have our pediatric orthopedic webinars. Uh, we have our other platform up and running. You can see it's a Zoom meeting, or you can just go to the website uh, that we've been listing um, every week up at the top, and the link is there with all the meeting ID and password, uh, which is fractures two this week for the second uh, series of lower extremity fractures. Next, we'll focus on hip, and then scoliosis, and then back pain. So tonight's expert international panel, um, I'm gonna speak about the anatomy of the brachial plexus, and then uh, Peter Murray from Mayo Clinic, uh, down in Florida. Uh, we'll discuss adult uh, traumatic injuries and uh, expiration and grafting, followed by Steve Lee from HSS in New York, who will discuss uh, nerve transfer type procedures in the adult population. And then Fraser Leversedge, who's now actually out in Colorado, uh, University of Colorado, will discuss secondary procedures for adult injuries. And then we'll move uh, to children, where Ann Bauer from Boston We'll discuss uh, brachial plexus uh, birth injuries, the evaluation and management initially, as well as primary surgery. And Kevin Little from Cincinnati will discuss secondary surgeries. And again, in case you missed the websites, uh, there they are. Hopefully everyone has them by now. So I'm gonna start with the uh, brachial plexus anatomy, and then we can go from there. Perfect. All righty. So I think we all recognize that the brachial plexus is a complex series of nerves up in the neck region. And from our webinar last week, we went over the anatomy of a nerve. Dr. Isaacs did a great job. And really the um, analogy I'll use when discussing the anatomy of a nerve, which is quite helpful, particularly as we discuss the brachial plexus uh, injuries, is um, this cable analogy where the wire itself is kind of like the axons, or you can think of it like fascicles, with the insulation around each wire being the, um, the myelin sheath, and then the outer tube kind of acting like the epineurium. And as we talk about the four types of injuries, particularly in um, children, um, but certainly in adults as well, the neuropraxia, where we just have some of the tearing of the myelin, but the fibers, the axons themselves, stay in continuity. The axonomesis, where some of those axons are torn, but not that outer cable, or the epineurium, is stay, which stays intact. And then a rupture, where the entire uh, root is pulled out of the spinal cord. Uh, sorry, a rupture or neurodomesis, where um, the entire epineurium is uh, severed either traumatically or uh, due to a force or the avulsion where the entire root is out of the uh, spinal cord. Um, and I think it's important to remember that there's about 10,000 axons in each root at the level of the brachial plexus. So the plexus are the ventral rami of uh, C5 to T1, and they egg out between the anterior and middle scalene muscles. And obviously it's quite complex. Um, there's lots of vital structures surrounding it, including the carotid sheath, which has the carotid artery, jugular vein, vagus nerve, and on the left side, uh, always a test question that pops up is the uh, thoracic duct is located there. And then it's also near the phrenic nerve and vertebral artery, both of which you don't want to damage. So when thinking about the anatomy itself, I think we all are familiar with this mnemonic about Randy Travis drinking beer. There's a couple of other ones out there, but it's really important to try and simplify it in your brain. Uh, as we go from the roots, trunk divisions, cords to branches. So if we start at the roots, again, it's the C5 to T1 roots. There's a couple of branches that come off at the root level. Off of C5, you have the dorsal scapular nerve to the rhomboids. And then we have our C5, 6, 7 contribution, which is the thoracic nerve. 
to the serratus anterior. When we get down to the trunk level, we know that there's the upper, middle, and lower trunks. And then we can again break it down to simplify it in our brains. There's only branches um, off of the upper trunk itself, which is C5, C6. And it's the suprascapular nerve to the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, and then the nerve to subclavius. The middle and lower trunks do not have any direct branches off of them. So a common question could be, what are the branches of brachial plexus off the roots and the trunks? And these are the four that we just mentioned, dorsal scapular nerve rhomboids, long thoracic nerve to serratus anterior, suprascapular nerve to supraspinatus and infraspinatus, and the nerve to subclavius. Um, as we continue on more distally, we have our roots and our trunks and our divisions. Uh, hopefully everyone recognizes that all the trunks have an anterior and posterior division. So there's six total. There are no branches at the level of the divisions, which makes life easy. So this is really the hardest part to remember is the cords. We have our lateral, posterior, and medial cords. And these are all named based off of the relationship to the axillary artery. There's lots of different branches at the level of the cords, but if you simplify it, it can become a lot easier to remember. So let's start with the lateral cord. There's only one branch that pops off, and that's the lateral pectoral nerve, which innervates the pectoralis major. The medial cord has three branches, the medial pectoral nerve, which innervates both the pec major and the pec minor, and then the medial brachial cutaneous nerve, otherwise known as the medial cutaneous nerve to the arm, and the medial antibrachial anti cutaneous nerve, which is the medial cutaneous nerve to the forearm. The posterior cord also has three branches. It has the upper subscap nerve, which innervates subscapularis, and then it has a lower subscapular, subscapular nerve, which innervates subscapular teres major. But in between these two, which is one of the more common test questions again, is this thoracodorsal nerve, which innervates latissimus dorsi. So a common question, as I said, what nerve arises from the posterior cord between the upper and lower subscap nerves? And that's that thoracodorsal nerve to latissimus dorsi. And just remembering that there's a nerve that pops out between the upper and lower subscap nerves. Again, simplifying this can help you memorize it. And then we end with our terminal branches. There's the lateral cord, which becomes musculotinous nerve. The posterior cord gives off the radial and axillary nerves. The medial cord gives off the ulnar nerve and then the medial and lateral cords combine to form the median nerve. Occasionally there are anomalies such as the prefix cord. What this is, is a contribution from C4, and this occurs in up to 25% of the population. There's also something called a postfix cord, where there's a contribution to the plexus from T2, which is only present in 1% of the population. So when you talk to our patients, and this becomes important for probably the remainder of this talk, I just went through lots of anatomy in about three minutes. Um, as I said, if you simplify it, it becomes a lot easier. And as you listen to lots of the talks tonight, just remember that C5, C6 will combine and form your upper trunk, and that'll cover most of your shoulder motion, your elbow flexion, and your supination. C7 will become the middle trunk, do your elbow extension, your finger extension, the MP joints, and your pronation. C8 and T1 will combine to form your lower trunk and do most of your hand function. So keep those basics in mind as we go through the rest of the talks tonight. Alrighty, so I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Peter Murray, who's gonna talk to us about adult traumatic injuries and um, repairing them and grafting them. Uh, thank you, Josh, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my charge is to talk about nerve grafting. Um, I don't have any relevant disclosures. Uh, Happy Mother's Day, that's something we all have in common. Um, I'm a West Virginian, so I can digress for just a second and uh, give you a little uh, known fact that Mother's Day uh, was first observed in Grafton, West Virginia, near where I grew up in 1908 by Anna Jarvis as a celebration to, uh, and a memorial to her mother, and that's the uh, Mother's Day church there in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, so I thought I would break this up into who, when, and how. Um, this is a brachial plexus injuries in adults is a disease of young males. About 93% of our patients are young males. Uh, about 93% are closed injuries. About 3% are lacerations. 3% are from gunshot wounds. Um, 
the vast majority are due to motorcycle accidents. About 14% are MVAs. And uh, uh, about 95% of the injuries we see uh, are supraclavicular in origin. Um, about 75% are associated with some sort of head trauma or uh, thoracic or shoulder trauma or C-spin injury. And this is something that's often forgotten or missed. About 20% are associated with uh, upper extremity vascular trauma. Um, and it's not an uncommon finding to have a, a shoulder dis uh, dissociation from the, uh, uh, from the chest wall. So something to always remember to check pulses, especially in the chronic situation, because many of these upper extremity vascular injuries are missed. Um, by and large, Josh has covered this, but just as a reminder that there are essentially two main categories of injuries. There's the uh, traction injury or axonomesis, and then there uh, is the um, complete uh, nerve disruption, um, and that can be divided into nerve root avulsion injuries from the spinal cord, which are unreconstructable, uh, to a trunk division, cord, or branch ruptures, and it's the uh, a ladder there that we're going to spend uh, the majority of my time with. Um, so it was commonly felt for many years that this was the most common pattern of injury. It was a dissociation between the head and the shoulder. Um, nowadays, we see uh, complete plexus injuries more often than not. Um, we can see them in sporting events. As I said, the vast majority are from motorcycle accidents. Uh, we can also see them from extreme positioning in the operating room, such as it might have happened in spine surgery or shoulder surgery, for example. Um, the physical examination we're, we're all very familiar with, but just a couple of key signs. Um, it doesn't take long to develop atrophy around the shoulder, particularly in upper extremity uh, or upper trunk lesions. Um, always check for the Horner sign, and that's uh, meiosis, ptosis, and anhydrosis for dry eye syndrome. Um, this is indicative of lower trunk injury. And also the tilted head sign. And this is a, a sign that uh, my partner uh, in Rochester, Alan Bishop, first described, where the head kind of tilts away in, in the patients that have complete plexus injuries, particularly patients that have complete flexal avulsion injuries. CT myelography is still the gold standard. We look for absence of uh, nerve rootlets in the avulsion injury. This is one thing we can kind of hang our hat on is the avulsion um, pseudomeningocele. It's nicely profiled on the right. Uh, we looked at uh, how accurate our preoperative diagnoses were in a study not too long ago. Uh, and what we found was that uh, although uh, CT, uh, MRI are, um, are fairly accurate for lower trunk injuries, it's really the physical exam that's the, the most accurate uh, for the upper trunk and middle trunk injury. So just something to keep in mind that the physical exam is still key. The priorities in sur uh, surgical management are really the elbow. Without elbow function, the hand function is uh, severely compromised. So restoration of the elbow function is really the treatment priority in brachial plexus injury. Uh, following that, shoulder function and hand function, whether it be active or passive, um, are the concerns in that order. So when? Well, no spontaneous meaningful neurologic recovery of part or all the upper limb in, in a reasonable period of time of observation is an indication for surgery, and we usually indicate that as six months, and that is confirmed on physical exam and neuro neurophysiologic testing. And this study by Martin et al. recently, in a large systemic review, um, they really found that um, uh, the there were significant better uh, outcomes in patients who were operated before the six month kind of hallmark that we um, uh, always use. And so, uh, certainly moving that uh, six months up to three or four months seems to have a better outcome, particularly when you're talking about nerve grafting procedures. Uh, the surgical indications, uh, uh, obviously, is evidence of a pan plexus injury. Any acute penetrating trauma is a, a surgical. Uh, emergency where the brachial plexus should be explored acutely. And then, of course, repairable lesions, um, in particular the intraplexal repair uh, or nerve transfer. Uh, and we'll hear more about uh, nerve transfer from Dr. Lee. Uh, the indications include physical stability and psychological stability. Um, particularly, the physical stability uh, uh, implies and necessitates cervical spine stability and bony stability. 
To those who have a little, uh, to those who have nothing, a little is a lot, as Sterling Bunnell, the father of hand surgery, says, and it's no more apropos than in brachial flexor surgery, where these people essentially have nothing, and you're trying to restore some element of function. Um, interplexal nerve grafting is what we're going to uh, concentrate on. Um, first of all, let's talk a bit about the exposure. Um, the vast majority of these lesions, as I mentioned earlier, are supraclavicular, and so the supraclavicular uh, exposure. Uh, can be taken in a number of different ways. I prefer a, a transverse incision in Langer's lines, just proximal to the clavicle. And the clavicle uh, is uh, shown there with the dotted line. Uh, the sternocleidomastoid is mapped out as well as trapezius, and I like to mark those out in the preoperative PACU prior to surgery. Um, through the supraclavicular exposure, uh, access to all nerve roots can be obtained. Uh, the infraclavicular exposure is necessar necessary for consideration of repair of medial cord uh, or branches. Um, this can be a tough dissection in uh, large individuals as shown here between the delta pectoral interval, but in smaller individuals, um, a wide access uh, to the cord, to the, uh, the brachial plexus uh, can be, uh, including the cords and branches can be obtained. So the prerequisites for nerve grafting include an intact proximal nerve, something that's intact to the spinal cord, and this can be confirmed by SSEPs, uh, using intraoperative neural monitoring. Um, there needs to be a limited zone of deficit somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 uh, centimeters and a healthy soft tissue be bed, along with available nerve autograft or allograft. The uh, look and feel, the proximal stump uh, should appear somewhat normal uh, with the identification of individual fascicular anatomy. Uh, nerve grafts can be obtained from the sural. That's the most popular and common location uh, with the uh, contribution of the perineal communicating branch, upwards of 30 to 35 centimeters of sural nerve graft uh, can be obtained. Allografts and conduits are still of questionable value in my opinion at this level. Uh, we know that uh, in this uh, study by um, uh, uh, Gusti et al. in Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery and a rat model that allografts uh, fared better in larger defects. But we also know from uh, several studies and several recent studies uh, that uh, hand nerve uh, regeneration uh, is also uh, very good with allograft and collagen uh, conduits. But nerve grafting still is the uh, gold standard and the primary goal for brachial plexus reconstruction. Um, and uh, it avails a number of different alternatives uh, in the uh, supraclavicular uh, brachial plexus injury. Um, C5, C6, and C7 nerve root lesions uh, can be amenable to nerve graft reconstruction, as can upper and middle trunk lesions, as well as divisional lesions and cord lesions. So in summary, brachial plexus injuries are a condition of young males. Reconstruction uh, is done with nerve grafting and nerve transfers. Um, earlier timing for surgery should be considered when grafting is planned. And at least in my practice, uh, autograft with the use of sural nerve graft is uh, still preferred. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Peter. Uh, we're gonna move on to uh, Steve Lee, who's now gonna talk to us about nerve transfers, something that's uh, really popularized over the past uh, several years as an alternative to what uh, Dr. Murray just talked about or as an adjunct. Okay, thanks uh, Josh and thanks everybody for being on tonight. Um, so yeah, my charge is to talk about nerve transfers for brachial plexus lesions. I'm Steve Lee from the Hospital for Special Surgery. So I'm gonna talk about the common transfers and outcomes for these. I like to break these down into what I call first generation or extra plexal transfers. One of the most key ones for shoulder function is the spinal accessory nerve, which is cranial nerve 11, to the suprascapular nerve that innervates the supraspinatus and infraspinatus part of the rotator cuff, initiates elevation of the shoulder, and uh, also powers external rotation, a very important function. Once again, it's a key transfer for shoulder function. And it's usually part of a dual transfer where you put the triceps to the axillary nerve as well. So you're re the uh, part of the rotator cuff plus the deltoid muscles and the teres minor if you can get it. The next extraplexal uh, nerve donor is the intercostal nerve. 
uh, which is a workhorse extraplaqueal nerve, especially for patients who have C5 through T1 total plexus cases. You can use multiple intercostal nerves, and the common recipients are the musculocutaneous nerve, axillary nerve, long thoracic nerve, very important one to get back because you want to stabilize the scapula to uh, maximize your shoulder function. And then can also power free functioning muscle transfers at, such as the free gracilis. Scott Wolf looked at this in a meta-analysis, intercostal nerves overall um, to the muscutaneous nerve give a 72% chance of M3 or better elbow flexion. So it doesn't work every time, but still a good number, you can bend the elbow. This is a case of mine from a few years back. Um, and to orient yourselves, the head is at the top of the screen. This is the left upper extremity that you see over here going down this way. These are the ribs over here. And these tiny little nerves here are the intercostal nerves. So you can see three intercostal nerves being laid up next to the musculocutaneous nerve over here. And you can't go to the motor branch itself like as you do in an Oberlin because it's not long enough. So you do lose some out the cutaneous portion, but that's so that you can reach without a nerve um, graft. Up here at the top on this other background are two intercostal nerves glued together. We use fibrin glue to put them together. And then this one next to it, that's the recipient is the axillary nerve, <clears throat> a very common um, kind of protocol that we do. And here's the patient um, 12 months after, and you can see she's bending, bending her elbow. So this is the patient with the intercostal nerves to the muscutaneous nerve, uh, intercostal nerves to the axillary nerve as well. She also had spinal accessory nerve to the suprascapular nerve, um, did put a long uh, intercostal inter, um, nerve to the long thoracic uh, nerve as well. And we also get some sensation back with lateral cord contribution um, median nerve uh, coming from two sensory intercostal nerves. Going on to the next is the second generation intraplexal transfers. The key one and pretty much the premier one is the ulnar nerve fascicle to biceps transfer. And uh, this was uh, introduced by Oberlin in 1994 and was really a game changer for uh, nerve surgery in general, not just brachial plexus. And it showed that you can actually get a lot of good function with nerve transfers. First uh, talked about in 1994 and then followed up in 2004 in JFGS, 24 of 32 patients achieved M3 or better elbow flexion. Then followed up by Sue McKinnon and also uh, Oberlin in 2005 and six, the dual transfer. So if one fascicle is good to the biceps, why not send also the brachialis? So that's, um, that's called the double fascicular transfer. So you actually open the ulnar nerve and you take out a fascicle or two that goes predominantly to the wrist flexion uh, by nerve stimulation. So you, had, you do real-time nerve stimulation in the case and you can see the wrist moving and the hand moving. It's very, very player potential but you open the nerve, take out a fascicle or two, and hook it up to the nerve that goes directly to the biceps, and then median nerve fascicle to the brachialis. In her series in 2004, McKinnon showed good um, recovery for, uh, for the patients. And here's a case of mine where the, um, this is the right upper extremity, uh, this way, the head is at the top. And I usually go the other way though, I usually go median nerve to biceps, because um, I think that it just reaches easier, and I do um, ulnar nerve fascicle to the brachialis. In a meta-analysis in uh, 2011, also by uh, my partner, uh, Scott Wolf, um, they showed that for the double fascicular transfer, 83% got M4, and 96% got M3 or greater, so really high numbers of success. And I found this in my practice. I've done many of these, and they almost always work. And they showed, this is somewhat controversial if you need the dual, but they found that the dual nerve transfers were best. And we normally do this at our institution. So the double fascicular transfer is a key transfer, especially for a C5-6 brachial plexus injury. I put that in an orange statement because it's, it's a key thing to remember. Also, it's frequently tested on in examinations. This is for a patient who's missing shoulder and elbow function, but the hand works. This is a patient of mine, uh, from a few years back um, after double fascicular transfer, six months out, static pictures here. Then you see over here a movie. And, um, and you can see her, um, the bulge of her biceps there. Curls. 
And then you look over here and uh, you can see her moving and look at the bulk of the biceps going down, these lat pull downs. And she had the double cicular transfer, also the spinal cess with a super scapular nerve, and then a C5 nerve grafted to axillary nerve. And three years post-op, same patient. You can see the flexion of the elbow. Elevation of the shoulder isn't all the way up, and they usually don't get all the way up, although we have another paper that showed they get better and better year after year. We have a paper that compared two years to 10 years, and the 10-year group was better than when they were at two years. So she has still time to go. And you can see the good external rotation that she achieved. Very important for function to get your hand away from your, your body. Another uh, very key uh, transfer uh, that's intraplexal is the triceps to axillary nerve transfer. Um, pop bars by SOMSAC. This is, thank you, Peter, for these uh, Mayo Clinic pictures, uh, by the way. Um, posterior approach. <laughs> and uh, you can do it from the axillary approach as well. But posterior approach, you open up. And a key landmark here when you do this is the teres major, which is this transverse muscle here. Once you find the teres major, the branches that go to the triceps are below it, and the axillary nerve is above that structure. So in the classic SOMSAC, you take the long head branch and you bring it up to the anterior division of the um, axillary nerve, but there are several other ways that you can do it. Um, we'd be here for an hour or two or more talking about all the different ways. But suffice it to say, that's a classic way to do it transfer, and uh, this is also a great transfer to use. And a couple um, clinical photographs. SOMSAC is one who popularized this uh, first uh, in 2003, seven out of seven patients with M4 deltoid function and 124 degrees abduction. Uh, also to note, this was part of a dual transfer with a spinal accessory to suprascapular nerve in addition to that transfer. Once again, from JBGS 2011, the meta-analysis, uh, when you use a dual transfer, you get much better function than if you just do single nerve transfer or nerve grafts alone. So dual transfer, spinal accessory, suprascapular, and triceps axillary for shoulder is best. Moving down the um, uh, ladder, this is for a patient who's less common. Uh, it's much more common to have a C5-6, like an upper trunk, uh, upper plus, which is C5-6-7, or complete C5 through T1. But if you have a patient who has a lower trunk injury, where the shoulder and the elbow work, but the hand does not work. This came out of China from Gu and colleagues. You can take the, the brachialis and use the brachialis as the donor and leave the nerve to the bicep so they can still bend their elbow. Take that nerve to the bicep, uh, I'm sorry, the brachialis and hook it up to the AN portion of the median nerve in the arm to get hand function back. And they had digital flexion restored in five, six patients. And we've done this transfer and it does work for the, um, the occasional patient you get. Other transfers that we use sometimes would be the medial pec to axillary nerve. Uh, that's a very good one to do. And the nerve to levator scapula, sometimes we add that for triceps. Um, you know, we'd be here for you know, a few hours if we we're gonna go over, or even a few days talking about all the transfers for plexus. But these are the, the main ones that we use. And then third generation of the distal transfers, Key one there is the distal AIN to ulnar nerve transfer. Um, you can get pinch and grip back and have the patient not claw. Um, and this does where it doesn't give as amazing, in my experience, um, power as this, but it does uh, do anti-claw, uh, which is also extremely helpful for a patient. Jaime Pertelli talked about for that same lower trunk type person, uh, patient, you can use supernator branches to the PIN, and this has been successful in our hands as well. Some controversial nerve transfers would be the phrenic nerve, uh, usually for elbow flexion when you have no other donors, and um, usually need to, need to lengthen this with a nerve graft. You do get some uh, negative effects, uh, decreased exercise tolerance, and it's lost popularity. Still done in Asia, as I hear, but not so much on the uh, Western part of the world. And then the contralateral C7, I'll let uh, my pediatric colleagues chime in on this one. Uh, we don't do this for adults. Um, it's gained more popularity when you do a prefertubral route. I'd like to hear what our peds folks say about this because I know they're, they're doing this more. Um, but it's for five level avulsions, targets with the muscatanus median nerve, modest results, lost popularity in the west part of the world, uh, donor defects written by the Mayo Clinic, a uh, bunch of cases, but poor results and one permanent donor defect. Um, and sensory transfers, we're trying to get protective sensibility may help decrease uh, neuropathic pain. Um, our key one is the sensory branch of the intercostal lateral cord contribution to median nerve, as I discussed before. You can also do some distal transfers. 
So in conclusion, nerve transfers have revolutionized results of nerve reconstruction, brachial plexus, part of the armamentarium, is a huge part of the armamentarium in our hands. And the theme is expensive donor to distal target. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Steve. Uh, we're gonna move on to uh, Frazier Leversage, who's out in Colorado now, who's gonna talk to us about reconstructive procedures for nerve surgery to address brachial plexus injuries. Great, thank you, Josh, and uh, thank you to the uh, faculty for some very interesting uh, talks. And uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for being a part of this uh, webinar. My charge this evening is to uh, discuss brachial plexus injuries with a focus on strategies for delayed adult reconstruction. And I have I have no uh, disclosures that are pertinent uh, for my talk uh, this evening. I do want to acknowledge Josh Abzug. Uh, Dr. Abzug's worked extremely hard in putting these uh, webinars together and bringing a lot of faculty together and increasing the collegiality for our specialty, which is tremendous. And then, of course, I want to uh, acknowledge all the uh, uh, mothers out there uh, and our own mothers for a happy Mother's Day. So uh, apropos for my move to Colorado, I suppose, uh, I, I think for anyone who likes uh, skiing, Fresh Tracks is a pretty special place. and. Uh, Fresh Tracks is uh, particular because uh, it's really the unknown and uh, a unique experience. And I like to think of uh, brachial plexus uh, surgery and brachial plexus patients in the very same way. You have to have a good strategy and you have to have good wits about you in order to get to the bottom safely and uh, with good, good form. And I think that is, if you look at each of our brachial plexus patients, you'll see that it's rare to have uh, very similar patients uh, uh, patients are very unique in their uh, both their presentation and in our treatment strategies. And really an homage to, to those of the pediatric faculty, I, I think that this is a good analogy for how we might look at secondary reconstruction for our brachial plexus patients. You have to consider the anatomy of the injury itself, consider the influence of time, what hat function do we have and what function don't we have. And then in considering these, you have to really figure out what you can use, what might be redundant and expendable uh, in terms of some form of secondary uh, reconstruction. And then with that information, you have to prioritize. And typically we prioritize elbow and shoulder function early on, uh, but we don't wanna give up on the hand and uh, uh, wanna provide as much function as we can and ultimately uh, a good result. There are several critical decision-making steps, and I think this is really important as you come to the secondary portion of your patient care. We've heard from Steve and uh, Peter about the initial care, particularly when you've got the time, timing right, and you have the opportunity to re-innovate, or re sorry, re uh, the, uh, the denervated muscles. However, with secondary surgery, we have to limit, we have to recognize that we have limited resources uh, with which to use to both establish priorities uh, and to pursue a good treatment plan. We have to engage and educate our patients and their families. Uh, we wanna make sure that our, we have a stable patient. Emotionally, uh, they're ready. Uh, they've been worked in with uh, pain management uh, and they've also got a stable zone of injury. They've got uh, many other things going on typically with these multiple trauma patients. And we have to honor the principles of surgical technique. The timing of our technique and the zone of injury also influences our choices of uh, procedures such as tendon transfers and so forth. And realistically, we have to really be careful because of these limited resources of avoiding uh, burning any bridges. And what I mean by that uh, is, is really, if you consider a wrist arthrodesis, which we might see in uh, brachial plexus patients with a flail limb as providing stability and improving the functional length of the limb. However, Remember that you burn bridges where you lose motion of the wrist and the potential value of tenodesis. So these steps are really critical in our decision making. We know from Josh's descriptions and, and uh, Peter's uh, outlines of, of early treatment, um, the Sunderland classification of nerve injuries. And when you get to have the secondary stages uh, face you in terms of decision making, most of these uh, are based around the second through fourth degree injuries where they're incomplete. And so you need to make sure that a nerve uh, deficit translated to muscle weakness uh, is considered in how you decide on what muscle 
tendon units are adequate to transfer considering the potential loss of strength over time. So our goals are to do two things really in, in secondary reconstruction. One is to optimize limb position and one is to maximize reanimation potential for our ultimately our de deficit. And we do this with muscular tendinous transfer, arthrodesis, and sometimes corrective osteotomy uh, to help out with these uh, goals. I also want to hi highlight Brand's principles of tendon transfers and particularly the notion of a stable wound, stable environment, uh, and a stable skeleton before we uh, pursue tendon transfers and not to ask too much of our tendon transfers. In other words, one tendon, one function, and trying to incorporate as much synergy as, as possible. And this is important from the standpoint of uh, tendon transfers. So it's, there's not a lot of time to go through every possible reconstructive option. So I, I think hopefully giving you some principles to think about will be helpful as, as you consider the upper limb. So in your shoulder assessment, as we've uh, Peter uh, Murray talked about, um, you really have to get a good sense as to uh, motor function and the relative uh, motor deficit. But you also have to consider the glenohumeral joint and the scapulothoracic joint, both face, uh, promote providing challenges in terms of pain, stability, and mobility. It's hard to do a tendon transfer and expect much of a recovery if you have a, a, a significantly uh, a contracted shoulder joint. And so you really have to pay attention to these uh, before you move to the next step. Tendon transfers is about the shoulder. Uh, these are some uh, examples of how we might consider uh, decision-making for uh, tendon transfers around the shoulder. For example, uh, reanimation of ex external rotation using uh, a extra plexal nerve, i.e. the spinal accessory nerve uh, uh, derived uh, transfer using the lower trapezius to the teres minor, uh, both in terms of proximity and being able to use the, the relative local insertion of the lower trapezius to the teres minor, um, and even using the contralateral lower trapezius as Ellison and others have demonstrated with good results for reestablishing external rotation about the shoulder. When you have loss of C5 and C6 in particular, we don't have many options for tendon transfers around the shoulder and the trapezius often comes into play, particularly with Saha's transfer described where we can expose the trapezius and mobilize its osseous insertion and advance it into the humerus to try to provide some meaningful recovery, both in terms of shoulder abduction uh, and sometimes extension. And this is a, an example here of, of uh, isolating the trapezius uh, uh, distally at its insertion and advancing it into the proximal aspect of the humerus. And this is a pediatric example of a young patient who's had this trapezius transfer. And you can see reasonable shoulder uh, abduction and, and arm elevation provided from this. This also sometimes helps in the younger population, which can be perhaps extrapolated to the adults uh, with, with centering the glenohumeral joint uh, which can help in terms of uh, relative biomechanics. Similarly, in our pediatric population, more commonly used uh, is a modified Hoffer or Lepiscopo type transfer, uh, transferring the latissimus dorsi to the rotator cuff or to the humerus. And this helps both in terms of external rotation, particularly when you might have a concomitant external rotator, or sorry, an ex, uh, rotator cuff injury, along with your uh, periarticular trauma about the shoulder. That being said, when we don't have much uh, to uh, work with in terms of tendon transfers, then stabilizing the shoulder with a glenohumeral arthrodesis may address the issues of pain, particularly in the stiff shoulder, uh, one which may help in terms of ultimate pain relief. However, the Mayo uh, series here shows that uh, there's a fairly high complication rate. Um, so that's uh, part of your expectations with your patients and improved uh, clinical outcomes have been shown with abduction and, and or flexion with greater than 25% uh, or uh, 25 degrees of positioning. At the elbow, we can consider many different transfers uh, from a muscular tendinous transfer perspective. Local transfers, such as a Steinler flexor plasty, which is known to all of us in terms of uh, advancing proximally the uh, flexor pronator origin. Regional transfers, such as a bipolar latissimus or a pec major transfer or free tissue transfers may be considered in the later reconstruction, such as a free gracilis uh, transfer. And this is a pectoralis uh, transfer in a patient uh, who is eight months now post-op, had a uh, significant injury to the uh, upper limb, 
and uh, pectoralis major was lengthened with a flexor carpi radialis and tercellary graft. The FCR was not uh, animated, uh, was not functioning. And so this provides a really nice uh, arc of motion. I find this uh, more helpful than a typical Steinler, which has a, a relatively limited arc of motion for most patients. Free innervated tissue transfer uh, in the young patients, such as this patient, uh, with a, uh, both a Hoffer transfer and free innervated gracilis. You can see him here at uh, roughly about six, seven months postoperatively uh, after already undergoing his Hoffer previously and now a free gracilis. This is a patient in Honduras through the Touching Hands program. Uh, this is a, a surgery performed by a team uh, led by Duretti Fufa. Uh, in one year post-op, you can see now is able to uh, flex against gravity and from a flail limb provides him with significant improvement to his uh, daily activities, even though it doesn't seem like much for patients who meet their uh, their function in uh, terms of uh, working and sur survival in many uh, challenging circumstances. Moving down the, the limb, forearm uh, reconstruction, uh, many times uh, patients will have significant uh, uh, contractors of the forearm based on a loss of uh, function. And when you've lost animation of the forearm, typically these patients will often be in either maximal supination or pronation. And in such positions, it can be a challenge particularly when you can reanimate the elbow uh, and give some reasonable function back to the hand, or if you have an intact lower plexus, um, repositioning of the forearm through uh, corrective osteotomy can be very helpful. The consideration currently is obviously in today's world of a more pronated uh, forearm and upper limb, uh, uh, typically pronate, uh, uh, creating a, a multiple level osteotomy through the forearm can be beneficial, such as you see here. Uh, with an improved position of the forearm for hand use and for function. At the level of the hand, uh, we have to consider intrinsic and extrinsic balancing. Uh, we may still have some uh, uh, middle trunk function. Uh, if we have a lower plexus injury, we may have some lower trunk function with a, a more significant upper and middle trunk injury. And so we have to really consider our options through appreciating the ulnar uh, hand function uh, provides us with grasp, and the radial hand is more for prehensile and dexterity related tasks. And you can see here an extrinsic finger function, simple tran uh, transfer or tenodesis of the small and ring finger to the functioning long uh, finger can be very helpful. Radial, tendon, radial nerve related tendon transfers can obviously restore function for positioning of the hand. And when you have a, 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 ch a challenging position of the thumb, uh, sort of a thumb and palm deformity, where the thumb is getting in the way of the finger uh, function, considering a, a reconstruction with arthrodesis, for example, or with even tendon transfers or the rerouting of the FPL tendon to become more of an abductor rather than an adductor can be very helpful. And then finally, down at the lower plexus injuries, consider your ulnar nerve transfers as being the mainstay of treatment. A Bouvier maneuver can be very helpful to determine if you need an active motor or if you need uh, some form of physical block to MP joint hyperextension. And you can see here using a uh, multiple tail graph from the more proximally innervated uh, extensors to the wrist can give you very reasonable positioning for uh, high end function. And similarly, the modified uh, uh, procedure by Fowler using uh, the EIP or EDM uh, for more of an ulnar claw hand. And then finally, the thumb and index key tip uh, pinch type of function is often lost, particularly with the lower trunk injuries. And your source of transfer here may be an intact uh, ring or long finger FPS, uh, or your ECRB, uh, which provides an, a very strong, uh, uh, but it does require a graph for your transfer. As you can see here, going from the dorsal aspect of the wrist through the intermetacarpal space here between the third and ring fingers, uh, and uh, providing a, a, a natural insertion and pulley uh, point for, for uh, biomechanically restoring adduction uh, of the thumb. So in summary, uh, you have to recognize available resources, establish your priorities for reconstruction in terms of function, engage and educate your patient and family, and honor the principles of surgical technique as you set out uh, on your sometimes multiple stage procedures. And again, avoid burning bridges uh, so that you uh, maintain the maximal uh, functional recovery. Thank you. Great, thank you, Frazier. Thank you for all those videos and pictures. Uh, we're going to change gears a little bit and now talk about uh, brachial plexus birth injuries. Uh, and Andy Bauer is going to lead us off talking about the initial evaluation and management and primary surgery. 
Thank you. Um, excellent talks by our adult colleagues. Um, and I will leave some things uh, for Dr. Little also. I'm just going to focus here on the nerve part of it and again try to get everything done in 10 minutes. Um, I do have some disclosures for grant funding. Um, as many people have mentioned, this is uh, brachial plexus surgery is a team sport and I have lots of help from mentors and to echo um, Dr. Abzug, if you have not yet called your mother, please do feel free to listen to my talk later on the uh, recording and call mom now. Um, so we are going to talk about um, infant evaluation, timing and indications for nerve surgery and uh, briefly on some surgical techniques. Uh, just a brief overview, this is a very common injury in kids, about one in a thousand live births still. Fortunately, only about 30% have an incomplete recovery, so most of these are going to be stretch injuries that will recover on their own. Um, there are surgical techniques for persistent deficits and weaknesses, um, but the assessments can be very challenging in um, babies, and indications are variable, and we'll talk about that. Um, the etiology... Um, most typically is a vertex delivery um, in a large infant, and that can give you um, a shoulder dystocia in which the head comes out, but one or both shoulders are stuck, uh, leading to an upper trunk or global injury. Uh, the risk factors for this are large babies. Um, maternal diabetes, interestingly, is an independent risk factor from the size of the baby um, because it actually changes the shape of the neonate. Um, as well as prolonged labor and shoulder dystocia, which is far and away the most, um, uh, the highest risk risk factor. Uh, when we talk about what can happen to the nerve, so in adults, we see lots more avulsions. Um, avulsions do happen in brachial plexus birth injuries, but they're rare. And we're looking mostly at stretch or postganglionic ruptures. And what we're trying to do when we're examining this newborn is, is try to see on a root by root level, is this injury an avulsion, meaning that we do not expect spontaneous recovery? Um, is it a simple stretch injury? And we'll see spontaneous recovery by one to two months of age and really normal function after that. Or something in between like a postganglionic rupture that will have limited spontaneous recovery and it may take us four to five months to sort that out. So we like to see infants by one to two months of age. Um, the first thing that we want to do is make the correct diagnosis. So all the things listed here are things that have been referred to my brachial plexus clinic as eval brachial plexus. <laughs> um, so first we want to confirm the diagnosis and then um, very important to characterize the pattern, um, whether this is an upper trunk or so-called herbs palsy or a global injury. And really the things that are going through your head are number one, does this child need an exploration and plexus repair, which is generally done somewhere between three to six months of age, but sometimes later. Uh, and then as Dr. Little will talk about, is the nerve injury affecting their shoulder de development? Um, and these um, internal rotation contractures and even shoulder dislocations have been reported as early as three to four months of life. So it's something that you really need to think about at the same time. Um, on physical exam outside of the affected extremity, just like in the adults, we're looking for Horner syndrome. Although um, this indicates lower nerve root avulsions, it can be simply a C7 avulsion, which is less problematic in a baby, um, can lead to a Horner's, where that uh, in adults is only described as C8 and T1. Um, and then other signs of worse prognosis would be uh, winging um, and hemidiaphragm paralysis. And then these are some images of the infant exam. So we're looking to elicit spontaneous movement. Um, this uh, can be done stimulated by stroking the arm in older infants, um, by providing toys, and uh, infantile reflexes can help us with that as well, such as the more or, or startle reflex. And then to assess the shoulder, we're looking at external rotation in both AB and abduction um, to assess the passive motion. Many of us use the Hospital for Sick Children Active Movement Scale. Um, this was uh, popularized in the 1990s and early 2000s as a way of assessing 15 movements of the upper limb on a zero to seven scale to try to understand uh, muscle recovery and muscle strength when you can't say, hey baby, you know, flex your biceps as hard as you can. And so this is a way of getting at that recovery in, in a way that's reproducible in infants. And this has shown to be valid um, and reproducible uh, between examiners. And what we're trying to assess 
um, is whether this is going, whether this exam is going to get better, whether these nerves are recovering and, and we can't see them from the outside. So we're using our physical exam to understand that. Um, Anti-gravity elbow flexion is talked about a lot in the pediatric world as a predictor of recovery. And it's very important to remember that this is just as a predictor. It's not that elbow flexion is the be all end all of brachial plexus birth injury, it's that this is a marker to tell you how well that nerve is recovering and how well then the shoulder function will be recovering. Um, Gilbert talked about um, offering surgery for those infants who did not regain anti-gravity elbow flexion by three months of age. Uh, Waters in the US um, described, um, pushed this out to more like five months of age um, based on his natural history study that we'll go through. And it's just interesting to think back to what I had said earlier about the recovery of the different types of nerve injuries. By five months of age, if you have an, you'll know if the baby has a stretch injury, but you'll also know if they have a rupture um, whether that rupture is recovering on its own or not. And so by five months of age, the babies that are not recovering their anti-gravity elbow flexion probably have upper trunk injuries that are um, too severe for the body to recover on their own. And so that's why that five month number probably is so useful. Um, and then lastly, there are some infants that will have um, a plateau in recovery when we thought that things were going well. And so um, the Toronto group again described the cookie test um, where success is getting the cookie to your mouth um, with less than 45 degrees of neck flexion um, and the arm adducted. Um, and this uh, test is used to describe um, enough elbow, uh, enough shoulder external rotation, enough elbow flexion to get the cookie to your mouth should be a good prognostic indicator. And if you can't pass that test by nine months of age, uh, then maybe you're missing a plateau in the nerve injury that needs to be addressed. And so for the residents um, and those taking your CAQ that are on the call here, um, it's important to remember kind of these established indications for surgery because there are so few truly testable brachial plexus questions. This is one of them and so it gets asked a lot. Um, and so for a baby that has avulsions, a flail limb, a Horner syndrome, what's clearly a severe global injury, we will go ahead and indicate surgery at three months of age because it's safe to do so. So by 90 days post delivery, we think that the risk of anesthesia goes down enough that um, surgery can be done safely and you're gonna find something to do um, in a flail limb with a Horner syndrome. Um, in a less severe injury, in an upper trunk injury, if there's failure of upper trunk recovery, which we describe as anti-gravity biceps, by that five to six month uh, time frame, um, what I did not talk about was the Toronto test score, but there's another score from um, the hospital for sick kids that you might see. Um, but those, those kind of um, upper trunk decisions are usually made at six months. And then finally, for that small group, that might have a plateau or an unusual recovery, we can use the, the cookie test at nine months of age. And so what do we do? I cannot take credit for this drawing. This draw drawing is from Naracus. Um, but um, what do we do when we talk about nerve surgery? Um, and so um, the, this is what I promised to come back to. So the Waters study in 1999 showed that the results of microsurgery were better than spontaneous recovery at five to six months of age but not better than spontaneous recovery at four to five months of age. Again, showing that the results of microsurgery are, are better than when your body can't repair the postganglionic rupture, but probably not better when, than when your body can repair the postganglionic rupture. Um, and we have some options. What I'll mostly focus on today is neuroma resection and grafting, as well as nerve transfers. And I'll just try to hit the highlights since Dr. Lee described the nerve transfers so well. Um, and so here's um, an example of a neuroma resection and grafting. So this is done um, much like with, in the adult in a small um, supraclavicular incision. Um, the nerves are isolated. You can see there a real um, avulsion of C7 here in the um, clamp. And, um, and the injured pathway is uh, removed and replaced with sural nerve cables. And the results of these are okay. Um, in um, a study that we did looking at long-term recovery of 21 infants, we saw um, AMS scores of six or better. So this is really um, you know, good anti-gravity movement um, in 91% of um, kids for elbow flexion, almost 70% for shoulder abduction, 31% um, for wrist extension and none for shoulder external rotation. And I'll, I'll come back to that um, again as well when we talk about the nerve transfers. Um, 
as uh, Dr. Lee described, so the Oberlin was the first and um, most popular nerve transfer, um, just showing it here marked out how you might approach it in a baby. Um, and Dr. Little um, taught us about the results of this, um, which are quite good in, um, in babies. And one of the things to think about is that the axon count for the biceps and brachialis is very similar to a single fascicle of the median or ulnar nerve. And so this perhaps is a reason why the Oberlin results are so good. Uh, complications in a young child um, are devastating, but fortunately rare. Um, the radial to axillary or SOMSOC um, uh, transfer, as Dr. Lee also mentioned, I just wanted to highlight here um, a different approach to it. And, um, for the infant, oftentimes we're doing uh, surgery supine completely. Um, it uh, might be difficult to maintain an airway and we might want to stay supine. Uh, and this can actually be approached through the same incision as the Oberlin um, if you make this little L shape into the axilla. And this can be a nice way to combine those two operations. I think this works better in babies where you can kind of move things aside very easily than it does in, in big muscly adults. And then finally, the spinal accessory to suprascapular nerve uh, has a bigger axon count mismatch. Um, again, has been described in both anterior and posterior approaches. Uh, we did look at the results of this um, uh, infants who had grafts to the suprascapular nerve versus um, transfers, and we found um, actually better results in the transfers than the grafts. And so that's just something to think about that may push us more towards uh, transfer in this specific um, instance. So to recap the risk factors, um, large infants, shoulder dystocia, Dr. Little will talk to us about the contractures in the shoulder. Um, and as I mentioned, if there is early return of anti-gravity elbow flexion, that is likely just a rupture and those babies will have an excellent prognosis. Um, in terms of decision-making for nerve surgery, if you have a global palsy and a Horner syndrome, then we can pull the trigger at three months of age upper trunk injuries, um, we will wait more towards six months of age, and then always remember those that could have the plateau and that there may be further need for surgery at ni by nine months of age. Thank you. Great, thanks Andy. Uh, we're gonna move on to our last speaker, uh, Kevin Little, uh, who's gonna talk to us about reconstructive options for these children. Gosh, thank you very much, Andy. I uh, really appreciate your, your talk, I'll try and uh, yeah, key in nicely to what you've talked about. Uh, secondary reconstructions are very, very common uh, after breakup of injury. It could be up to 20% uh, after an injury or even up to 77% after a microsurgical reconstruction. So something that we should be aware of if we're evaluating these kids in the long term. Now, this can happen because of insufficient recovery or contracture development. Uh, we know that contractures happen because of impaired uh, growth of the muscle due to denervation in the neonatal period. This happens predominantly in the upper subscap and biceps brachialis or the C5-6 innervated muscles around the shoulder and elbow. Secondary reconstruction can typically be in the shoulder because of internal rotation contracture, glenohumeral dysplasia, or even an abduction contracture, which gives you this pretty sign because of your abduction contracture. When you adduct the shoulder, you actually elevate the scapula at the back. Uh, in the elbow and forearm, this leads to an elbow flexion deficit or contracture, uh, as well as supination contracture. Uh, and the wrist and hand is most often in a wrist flexion contracture. Uh, we evaluate the kids in uh, after infancy the ba basically the same way they do uh, in, in the, uh, infant age. Uh, we still use the AMS score. The Malia score is a bit more common and easier to do as they get older. Uh, and you can even assess uh, muscle strength in the older kids. Uh, it's also important to do a pain assessment uh, on them uh, as they grow, as this can become a much more common problem. Uh, shoulder involvement typically starts as weakness, like an abduction, forward flexion, external rotation due to the C5-6 loss of uh, deltoid uh, and rotator cuff muscles, but then develops into contracture through those pathways we talked about previously. Uh, and then this can lead to progressive uh, posterior subluxation of the joint due to uh, predominantly internal rotation uh, and uh, pressure on the posterior aspect of the glenoid with growth. This uh, can lead to a pseudoglenoid uh, formation, uh, then an incongruent joint or a dislocation, which is not truly a dislocation, but a, just a completely posterior subluxated joint. Uh, this happens first because of the contracture of the internal rotators, especially the upper subscap uh, as the interarticular part that we'll talk about later, uh, as well as muscle imbalance with uh, strong internal rotation. There are four internal rotators and two external rotators, and so that imbalance leads to worsening of this dysplasia. And this all has a posterior subluxation of the glenohumeral joint, which then leads to the dysplasia that we see here on the right. 
This is best evaluated with ultrasound as a kid. Uh, you look for a couple of things. One, the alpha angle, very similar to the uh, hips, uh, as, you, as you see in the hip dysplasia. And then the PHHD, the posterior humeral head displacement, which is a percent of the humeral head posterior to the uh, posterior or more margin of the uh, glenoid. This should be about 50%, and anything like this, which uh, is almost 85, 90%, is, is um, pathologic. Uh, radiographs are sometimes used in older kids. Uh, you can see in this bilateral shoulder x-ray, you can see uh, on the right x-ray here, there's a little bit less uh, uh, development of the of humeral head, uh, and you can see uh, the glenoid is not clearly marked. Uh, CT scan is useful as well, though it does not show the cartilaginous structures. It can show you the physis, uh, and the MRI is probably the mainstay of diagnosis of uh, glenoid dysplasia. You can look at the PHHA or a midline uh, through the center of the scapula uh, and then the posterior humeral head uh, or the percent of the humeral head anterior to that line as well as the glenoid version angle is the angle between the scapular margin and, uh, and, and the glenoid. This is originally classified by Birch as either a convex uh, or concave, convex or biconcave glenoid. This is uh, further subdivided by waters uh, looking at the one through six uh, with a normal glenoid all the way to the complete dislocation that you see almost here. Uh, the important thing about shoulder dysplasia is you have to evaluate it early. This is not something that's done secondary. Uh, we call it secondary surgeries, but it's really uh, primary in time. This can be seen as early as three months of age and it can be an up to eight to 10% of infants. Uh, so we do a screening ultrasound for any child who has less than 45 degrees of passive external rotation. You wanna make sure you evaluate that joint well. And if the ultrasound is positive and you're concerned about it, uh, then an MRI is the next step. Uh, the best treatment for any kind of shoulder problem is prevention. Any kind of uh, therapy that you can initiate with home exercises, OTPT visits either at home or uh, even telehealth nowadays. And then uh, if they do progress, you can do a Botox injection uh, to internal rotators uh, and casting and external rotation. Uh, if they get stuck, you can do a release of internal rotation contracture, you can do tendon transfers, and worst case scenario, glenoid osteotomy or humeral osteotomy. Uh, surgery is really resolved, uh, reserved for those who fail all else. Uh, so if they're stuck enough and you can't get the external rotation you need, then a subscapular, subscapularis release is performed, either a subscap slide or a mini uh, open through the inferior approach, or arthroscopic release of the intraarticular tendon. As you can see uh, here, you can grab uh, a little bit of the, of the tendon. You can do a shoulder reduction, either closed or arthroscopic assisted, a mini open or plus or minus a coracoid release. Uh, and then tendon transfers as described by Fraser Leversedge earlier. Uh, our technique is generally an arthroscopic release. Uh, we use a posterior portal, uh, and then we use either a spinal needle or a small upbiting right through through anterior portal to get rid of enough of the, uh, of the tendon uh, to get out to about 60 degrees of external rotation, uh, and then plus or minus a tendon transfer. Generally, if you're if you're tight enough to dislocate in infancy, that is between before one year of age or even before two years of age, you're going to need a tendon transfer to stabilize the shoulder to hold it there. Otherwise, it will redisplace almost all the time. And these all have excellent functional results in the MLA score. The glenoid osteotomy is also indicated, uh, it, but this is typically for older patients or patients who have failed tendon transfer surgery. Uh, the best study looked at this, looked at kids from ages 2 to 16, all had improved shoulder active uh, and passive external rotation, increased MLA scores, uh, and improved glenoid version in PHHA. Uh, this is done through a big posterior approach uh, where you can see uh, the deltoid all the way off the spine of the scapula uh, down to the joint area. You release the teres major and latissimus dorsi so you can transfer them later. Get down to the joint, move the infraspinatus or uh, cut the infraspinatus and make a large glenoid osteotomy at the rim, uh, taking care to avoid the infraspinatus nerve branch that comes around the glenoid neck. Uh, this was done uh, in one of our cases at our institution. We have one month post-op a one year post-op, which you don't really know how good it is until you look at the pre-op MRI to show the complete resolution of the PHHA, uh, as well as the glenoid version, which is back to almost normal. Humeral osteotomy is more for kids uh, who have a contraction rotation who are older, who do not have any remodeling potential uh, and are not candidates for a glenoid osteotomy. Uh, for them, once again, prevention is the best cure. Uh, it can also be done for patients who have a contraction and external rotation. So if they had an internal rotation, uh, contracture, had a tendon transfer, but now stuck in external rotation, you can do an osteotomy to realign them. Uh, we typically do this for a medial approach, but there are other approaches that can be done. You use uh, therapy uh, to help guide you how much rotation. You can get up to 90 degrees of internal rotation or external rotation with your osteotomy, but you don't want to take too much. Make sure you balance internal and external rotation to give them the right amount. Uh, it heals pretty quickly, uh, and they get their function back right away, uh, as you can see here. 
Uh, moving down to the elbow, uh, it is also prone to dysfunction, either the weakness uh, with a loss of elbow flexion or extension, and more typically a flexion contracture or dysplasia, which you can see on this x-ray here. Elbow flexion contractures are most common due to denervation of the C5-6 innervated muscles. It does get worse during growth spurts and is often best treated with therapy, either nighttime splinting or serial casting. We have equivalent results with surgery as well as with OT and, and serial casting for the uh, release of elbow flexion contracture. Uh, if you do have elbow flexion deficits, uh, even after nerve grafting or nerve transfers, or if they're prevent, presenting late, there are things that you can do to, to help this. One of the older techniques is the Steinler flexor plasty. This is utilizing the Steinler flex. The wrist and finger flexors attach to the medial epicondyle, which provides some elbow flexion moment, uh, but it's weak. And if you move that up on the anterior humerus, then you can actually improve elbow flexion. Uh, uh, by taking the medial epicondyle and the flexor pronated mass and, and moving it as well. Uh, other options include a latissimus dorsi transfer, which is bipolar or rotating around the pedicle, or a pectoralis major, which, which can be done either unipolar by attaching it via directly to the biceps muscle or via a fascia lata graft to distal biceps, or a bipolar where you take the insertion uh, and put on the acromion and you take the origin off the sternal head and tubularize it and attach it to the distal biceps tendon. Another option is a free muscle transfer, which is described eloquently by Dr. Leversage as well. Uh, in the forearm, they're most typically in a supination contracture, uh, and this can typically be found more in the extended upper trunk or total plexus palsy. Uh, and prolonged uh, def deformity can uh, lead to progressive contracture uh, as well. We need to assess both uh, passive and active motion as well to see. Uh, in patients with a supple supination posture, so they have good active pronation or passive pronation, you can do a biceps rerouting. We detach the biceps uh, after cutting it in half, wrap it around the, uh, the, the proximal humerus, avoiding the PIN, uh, and then reattaching it to itself to allow to provide a pronation moment instead of a supination moment. Uh, if they have some function, uh, but they're contracted and they're not supple, then an osteotomy, either of the radius and ulna or just the radius, uh, can be done to rotate their arm into a more of a pronated posture. A lot of techniques described, uh, and I have noticed over time and some others as well, that this can remodel through rotational remodeling and then progress right back to a supination position over time. Uh, this has more to do with uh, younger kids are more likely to uh, Represent. Thus, in patients with a supination contracture and minimal function, uh, a one bone forearm is probably the best solution. Uh, place the forearm in 10 to 20 degrees of pronation, uh, do an end to end osteotomy as, as seen here, or an end to side or side to side osteotomy. We simply fuse the bones together in the appropriate position. This allows for uh, maintenance of a, a good position for the forearm for bimanual use. Uh, the wrist and hand, uh, lastly, talking. Uh, mostly in the extended uh, upper palsy or global palsy, uh, even though C6 can sometimes be involved in the wrist and finger extension. Uh, generally, the FCU is, re uh, is recovery just due to the amount of uh, innervation that gets to that muscle. Uh, so an uh, uh, FCU transfer is, is, is commonly used. Uh, finger recovery is variable, although if you don't have good wrist extension, generally the farther distal along the PIN, uh, uh, you. Uh, also do not have good recovery. Uh, so these patients often will need tenodesis for finger function. Uh, for any kind of wrist flexion contracture, OT is the best way to start with splinting, uh, serial casting, or contralateral constraint therapy. Uh, so you can try uh, other, other types. So there's a nighttime resting hand splint that you could use, you could see here. You can use daytime splints to help augment function uh, or contralateral constraint therapy to really help promote function of, of, of the hand. Surgical treatment is also used as well. Uh, this is typically an FCU to ECRB transfer or green transfer. Uh, the thing to think about this differently than and cerebral palsy uh, is that you can route this through the interosseous membrane between the radius and ulna. This gives you a better line of pull for a straight wrist extension and does not aggravate the supination posture that wrapping around the ulna can, can give you. Uh, you tension this transfer based on finger function. If you have better finger function, you need less tension because you have more augmentative function with the fingers as well. Uh, the FCU and ECRB tenant transfer can be combined with other procedures of the forearm, especially if you're a supination contraction. Uh, but there is a need for uh, really uh, supervised therapy with the hand therapist after this type of tenant transfer to make sure they can gain the most function possible. Uh, and lastly, in the patients with have minimal function, a wrist arthrodesis is, uh, is possible as well. This is typically uh, done just to stabilize the wrist in position of function, uh, but you want to be doing this to avoid damage to the physis, as you can see here with the longitudinal pin down the radius to, uh, to allow for continued physial growth. 
So uh, in conclusion, many patients with brachial plexus birth injury will benefit from secondary surgery, up to 20% of all patients and 77% of patients that had microsurgery. The shoulder is the most common location for secondary surgery. Uh, beware for uh, shoulder subluxation and dysplasia, even as early as three months of age, and surgical treatment can be a benefit to these patients. So once again, thank you all uh, for listening uh, and happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Uh, thanks to Josh uh, and Sarah for every, uh, for helping host these meetings, uh, and I appreciate all the other uh, panelists today. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Again, I want to thank all of our panelists, um, and thank you for joining us this evening. Again, next week we will be uh, discussing distal uh, radius fractures, and uh, for those of you that are interested, uh, you can hop on over right now. We're going to go to our pediatric orthopedic uh, webinar on uh, lower extremity fractures around the knee and leg and ankle. Thanks again. Hope everyone has a good night. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, okay, Josh. Josh.